Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, friends. My name is Patricia Anderson. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers, and I'm pleased to be joining you today from the lands that were originally inhabited by the indigenous Tongva people in what is now known as Southern California. Uh, you may be wondering if you've come to the right place, and if you're looking for the PSG First Monday webinar, you have. Um, many of you have not seen me on screen before, but we've met in person. Today, I'm stepping in for our fearless leader, Paige Gardner, who is feeling a little bit under the weather. Most importantly, I want you to know that Paige is just fine. Um, she just doesn't have <clears throat> a physical voice to speak with today. So hopefully we will do a good job of representing her. Um, we're really excited about today's webinar. Also, you might be wondering, is today really the first Monday in July? And the answer is not really, um, if you're looking at a calendar, but I think lots of folks enjoyed a nice holiday break last week. And so we decided to host this month's first Monday webinar on the actual second Monday of July. So with all that said, I just have a couple of housekeeping remarks, and then I'm gonna introduce our speakers and we'll get right to today's presentation, which we're all really excited about. Um, so housekeeping wise, I just want everybody to know that we turn the chat off during these webinars. It's really just um, to help us keep track of your questions and comments better. And we would love to see those questions and comments in the Q&A. It's a couple of talk bubbles at the bottom of your screen. Please post them anytime. We'll do our best to get to as many of your questions live as we're able to today. And even if we don't get to them all, um, we do comb them for data and suggestions after the fact. So please feel free to be talkative in there. The other thing that we've done is we've turned on a feature um, called the upvote feature. It's a little thumbs up at the bottom of each question. And if you see a question that you're like, yes, that was a, that's what I was gonna ask, just go ahead and click that and that will help us keep the questions organized as well. All right, so let's get to business. We're really excited today to be featuring Catalyst. Many of you in the progressive community know the terrific work that Catalyst has been doing for a really long time now. Catalyst compiles, enhances, stores, and dynamically updates data on over 256 million voting age individuals across all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Today, we're joined specifically by Horace Akil and Hillary Anderson, who um, are part of the team at Catalyst. And um, we're gonna post their full bios to the chat because they are very impressive individuals. But um, in true Catalyst fashion, they have a lot of data and a lot of slides to share today. So I don't wanna spend too much time telling you how awesome they are. I want to just let you see it and experience it for yourselves. We're working on um, finding out if we have clearance to share the slides after the fact, we'll let you know. Um, and regardless, this recording will be posted by the end of this week um, on the PSG Consulting webinar website. So with that, I'm turning it over to Hillary and Horace, who are going to give us a great slideshow uh, about what happened in 2022. Were you pleasantly surprised? Were you shocked? What can we learn? Take it away, Hillary. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who was able to join us today. Um, it's really an honor to be here and to present um, our findings to you all. So we're gonna go ahead and share um, our presentation. Um, I hope everyone is able to see uh, this opening slide and, and as we kind of go through this presentation. Um, Looks so good, just, Hillary. Excellent. So uh, just to set the table, um, Catalyst um, sits on the la largest longitudinal voter file, and this really enables us to have a more accurate and precise look back at what happened in past elections. We're able to marry our voter file um, data, the actual certified vote history from the states, um, to polling data, commercial data, and other sources to paint um, the most accurate picture um, as to what actually happened um, demographically and geographically in the um in, in the past elections. So with that bit of background, we're going to pivot into um, our findings. Here we have um, our six main findings organized into three distinct buckets. Um, so during this presentation, we'll um, just follow each of these buckets um, accordingly. Um, the first is that the 2022 election defied conventional wisdom and historical trends. I'm sure this finding is probably pretty obvious to everyone, but I really want to highlight out just how distinct and different um, this, this midterm was. And part of what is underlying that is this difference between the highly contested and less contested states. There were um, two um, distinct elections. If you kind of look at this, the highly contested versus the less contested places, 
And uh, the phrase that Horace and I like to use in this presentation is, you know, a tale of two electorates. Um, and so we're, we'll go through and, and show that um, in our presentation here as well. Um, after that, we're going to pivot to the shape of the electorate. So this is um, looking at some of the uh, demographic trends that we noticed from our data. In particular, the strong support and turnout among millennial voters, especially in these highly contested states. We're also going to look at the stability in coalitions. The winning 2020 um, coalition in these highly contested states was pretty similar to what we saw um, in, in 2020. And there are a few exceptions between the between what happened um, in some of these um, coalitions demographically. And so we'll highlight out those um, distinctions, but really remarkable um, stability in coalitions um, in the highly competitive states. Um, and then finally, in this uh, demographic section, we'll talk about gender, um, especially in the context of Dobbs and the impact um, that that decision had, particularly on um, women and their registration and participation in the 2022 cycle. And then finally, we um, will close out with a brief discussion about MAGA extremism and how um, the MAGA Republicans performed, particularly in these highly competitive states. Um, so with that, we'll um, circle back to our first couple of findings. Um, Typically in midterm election years, especially after um, an incumbent uh, president's uh, first uh, term in office, we expect to see pretty steep losses in the House. Um, however, after the 2022 election, we only lost nine House seats and actually made up ground in the Senate. Um, this is remarkable and definitely bucks um, conventional expectations of what we would have thought was going to happen in the midterm. And I would say what most people thought was going to happen in early 2022. When we looked under the hood at where the changes were and what was exactly causing this difference, what we found was that there was a distinct difference between what the election looked like in the highly competitive um, places versus what they looked like in the less competitive places. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, isn't that always how it is? Or aren't these places always different? And the answer is no. When we look at the democratic support change from the previous presidential to the following midterm, we noticed that um, performance in the toss-up and likely um, a toss-up in highly competitive places tends to look about the same. So from 2012 to 2014, Democrats performed about four points um, worse. They lost four points support, whether that was in a toss-up or a lean election. Um, going from 20, um, 20, uh, 2016 to 2018, we see about a three point um, overperformance from in 2018 compared to 2016. Once again, that was regardless whether we were in a highly competitive or less competitive election. However, looking from 2020 to 2022, we see that in the places that were the most competitive, the toss up lean elections, that the democratic performance was about on par with the winning performance in 2020. And where the elections were less competitive, um, we see this four point drop. So this is where we really see that separation and how it's how it is um, different from historical trends um, inside of 2022. And when we think about, okay, well, why is that the case? Um, obviously, things looking into things like turnout become um, imperative. And what we see here is that um, in the places with the highly competitive Senate and Gov elections, so your Nevada's, Pennsylvania's, Arizona's, Michigan, Turnout was higher in 2022 than it was in 2018. And this is remarkable and fascinating because I think for many people um, on this call and people who were engaged in, in elections, you know, 2018 represented a really high watermark for a midterm election. But here we have um, performance, a turnout um, even higher than that in these places. Um, so turnout is higher, you know, six to eight points in a lot of these places at the Senate level. However, when you look at um, the places without the competitive elections or the less competitive elections, you see um, about an eight point, seven to eight point drop in turnout. So once again, really painting this picture of two different kind of types of elections happening in, in different types of states. Um, and that's not the full story. We also um, observed that 17 million voters in 2022 were registered for the first time after 2016. And we feel that this is a real testament to the power of folks on the ground who have been engaged in voter registration, really capturing all of that momentum coming out of the 2016 cycle and showing that staying engaged with those voters and continuing those registration efforts 
has um, paid off. These 17 million voters represent about 15% of the total voters in the 2022 election. Um, so that's the good news. However, the other side of that coin is that there were still 128 million um, voting eligible people who did not participate in um, the 2022 election. Now, this represents a, a little bit of a regression back from 2018, where you had 119 million people who stayed out. However, um, it was obviously a much more engaged election, mid midterm election than 2014. Um, so while that's some good news compared to 2014, um, to even get back and rebound to those 2018 levels, there's definitely more work to be done um, in engaging the voting eligible population here. And with that, I will pass things over to Horace to walk through some of the demographic findings. Thank you so much, Hillary. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here um, with all of you. Um, so many uh, um, colleagues and friends on this chat. Um, we're really looking forward to, I think, um, digging deeper here. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, firstly, when we say um, an election is contested, we are using Cook Political's definition um, from their last rankings. But if you were to use really any of the um, definitions inside election sabado or past election results, you would get to a very stable battleground. And it is also um, uh, overlaps uh, closely with the presidential battleground as well. Um, and then the final note here is that Hillary and I, by virtue of our initials, um, like to call ourselves the HaHas. Um, and we are really, really excited to be here today to, uh, on our next uh, stop of our tour. So um, Hillary, let's jump in to the next slide, please. All right, so I think, um, as Hillary mentioned, we're gonna talk about um, uh, the, the shape of the electorate and how it differed between highly contested states and the rest of the country. Um, as Hillary, I think, uh, illuminated, ultimately um, the entire frame that we are using here is contested versus not, because that is such a key part of this story and why um, um, disciplined investments, disciplined organizing and, and um, uh, uh, voter salience um, uh, played a huge role in this election, which is uh, bucks about 100 years of history. The first piece that we want to talk about is youth, um, young voters. There's been quite a bit of um, discussion around whether youth, um, whether there was a youth quake or not, and what role youth played in uh, democratic victories. And ultimately, we define youth um, as um, folks uh, who are part of the younger generation, so Gen Z and millennial voters. Um, importantly, we're not just defining them as an age cohort because ultimately people move through ages if you compare them to past election cycles. So the first headline that really um, 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 jumps out at us is that um, in highly contested states, um, uh, the election um, looked incredibly similar to 2018. So let's describe this chart a second. There's a, quite a bit of interesting stuff going on here. On the x-axis, we're looking at age um, as denoted by birth year. So on the left, you're seeing the youngest voters and Gen Z and millennial voters um, on the left panel there as we're drawing it out. Uh, and then we are correlating that with the thousands, uh, with um, overall ballot casts in terms of thousands of votes. Importantly, we're not using CVAP here because um, the, some, um, uh, complications uh, regardless uh, regarding the census. Uh, but what we are doing is looking at the total number of votes because 2018 featured 11, uh, 7 million fewer votes than 2022 overall. But in highly contested states, um, they were about um, the same as 2018, which is just extraordinary. Um, so the black line here um, is showing you the 20 uh, 22 election, the blue line is 2018, and the red line is 2014. Um, so let's look at the black line here. Um, as you move from younger voters all the way to older voters, you see that participation starts to increase um, um, right around middle age, which is very common uh, for the shape of the electorate of an electorate by age. Uh, but what it really jumps out at you is that uh, 2022 in these highly contested states was identical to 2018, even though 2018 had 7 million more votes. Um, when you particularly look at younger voters, so the left-hand panel here of Gen Z and millennial voters, you see that overall ballot cast was even slightly higher compared to 2018 among these generations. Again, pretty extraordinary. On the other side of this chart, uh, on the right-hand side, you see that among older voters, the total number of ballots 
dropped um, slightly. Now, part of that is aging out of the electorate. It's uh, past people passing away and so on. But certainly, you're seeing an even slightly younger electorate compared to 2018's youth-fueled blue wave midterm. And we um, added 2014 here, so you can see the, the extraordinary difference in these contested states between a low salience midterm, which was, um, I think, typified by 2014, and um, the elections that we did see in 2018 and 2014. Um, notably, 2014 was also much lower uh, among young voters. Um, here you see a huge gap. So this was uh, young voters really showed up. Um, next slide here, Hillary. Thank you. Um, and young voters didn't just show up in terms of casting ballots. They also tended to support Democrats by a higher margin, uh, even if you look at it by generation or by the more traditional definition of age cohorts. Um, here in two panels, we're showing you um, the overall national support for young voters among Gen Z and millennial and 18 to 29 year olds. Uh, compared to President Biden's coalition in 2020, because we're just looking at the two-way vote share, and we want to see the youth who did turn out in 2022, were they more or less democratic uh, than Biden's winning coalition? Um, and we see that they were about a point more democratic, even compared to President Biden's um, extremely high salience, uh, again, youth-fueled election, um, both in the House national House vote, but also in the highly contested Senate and uh, gubernatorial statewide elections. If you look at it by just age ranges, you end up seeing about two to three point um, more democratic um, uh, youth vote, even compared to 2020. So really just extraordinary um, and really speaks to early investment, I think, among youth groups as well. Um, there are two reasons for this increase in support, even compared to President Biden's coalition. The first is that youngest voters, um, Gen Z and millennial voters, are uh, much, much more diverse compared to their older counterparts. So whereas the on the other end of the spectrum, uh, the silent or greatest generation uh, comprised about 16% uh, were voters of color, uh, about 30% among Gen Z and millennial voters are voters of color, and they tend to support Democrats by four in every five votes. Uh, so extraordinary diversity there. But then the other piece is that even among white voters, 18 to 29 years of, of age, we see a six point swing compared to support for President Biden. Again, really extraordinary from 52% support for Democrats to 58% support. So these are the twin drivers uh, that led to an improved uh, support among uh, for Democrats, even compared to President Biden. Uh, next slide, please, Hillary. Thank you. And we're used to, um, especially in the last four election cycles, we're used to now it's almost become axiomatic that younger voters are going to support um, Democrats uh, by almost super majority, 60 to 60, 60% um, uh, 60 to about super majority support. But that has certainly not always been the case. Um, in if you look at Bush versus Gore, the first arrow in, in 2000, you see that about half of um, younger voters tended to support um, Bush. Um, if you go back even further, a majority of youngest voters, particularly in midterms, uh, tended to support uh, Republicans. So while it's really important to celebrate and learn the lessons uh, um, that we can to maximize vote turnout and support among younger voters, we certainly cannot take it for granted. We have to continue um, uh, persuading and mobilizing um, uh, like-minded voters among the youngest cohort. Next slide, please. Now switching over to race, um, looking at the shape of the electorate by race and ethnicity, um, the, the key top line here is that Democrats yet again reassembled a highly multiracial coalition, not just a multi-class coalition, uh, in the 2022 midterms. So about a third of the Democratic, Democrats' coalition was people of color, um, whether that is Latino, AAPI, Black voters, multiracial, biracial voters. Um, the second third, uh, is white non, excuse me, white college voters. So a big question uh, after the Trump realignment of white suburban college educated voters was whether this will continue even in the post-Trump era, era. And partly, I think that is certainly true. It, it, it um, uh, White college voters yet again provided an enormous uh, boost to Democrats. But then the final um, third among the Democratic coalition is white non-college voters. Ultimately, they, uh, white non-college voters are the single biggest uh, block of the electorate um, in America. And um, while we tend to view them as sort of, um, uh, media covers them as this sort of flatline group, this, a, a third of the Democratic coalition still remains white non-college voters. Um, so compare this highly multiracial, multi-class coalition with Democrats where 50, uh, with Republicans where 55% made up 
um, white non-college voters and a full 86% made up white voters overall. Um, next slide, please, Hillary. Um, now we're gonna look at the sort of the twin uh, drivers of um, the shape of the electorate. One is um, the overall uh, participation by race. And then the second is support uh, among those who participated for Democrats. So on the left-hand bar, we're showing you the shape of the electorate uh, compared to 2018, which is the most analogous midterm, particularly for highly contested races. We're only looking at the highly contested statewide races here. Um, and the picture is one of remarkable stability in, in highly contested states. Um, ultimately, um, the shape of the electorate by race looked virtually identical. On the right-hand side, next slide, please, Hillary. Thank you. Um, in terms of two-way support, again, we're looking at President Biden's coalition here. You see that um, the uh, extraordinary civility, even compared to President Biden's um, coalition, um, overall, um, the overall electorate was about a point more democratic as ca Catalyst estimates. Um, and uh, white uh, voters were two points more um, democratic. API voters were slightly less, about um, two points less democratic. Um, and overall, it was a very, very similar election to both 2018 in terms of the shape of the electorate and President Biden's coalition in terms of support. So really extraordinary work here. Um, but this demarcation in the tail of the two electorates that Hillary and I have been talking about becomes super clear if we look at the next slide, uh, which is the national vote. And here, um, uh, 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 the, in terms of the shape of the electorate compared to 2018, the electorate was two points more white, um, one point less, um, uh, and one point less black. Um, and that um, was one portion that contributed to a substantially more Republican electorate compared to President Biden's coalition. Um, uh, so compared to President Biden, Democrat, uh, this electorate was three points more Republican, three points less Democratic, compared um, to uh, 2020. And white voters were two points more Republican, black voters were three points more Republican, and AAPI voters, even though they form a much smaller share of the electorate of about 4%, um, were seven points more Republican uh, than 2020. So if this support pattern had been mapped out to in highly contested states, then we certainly would have seen a red wave of the kinds of numbers that we were concerned about starting in 2022. Um, next slide, please, Hillary. Um, we have so far been talking about um, um, highly contested states as a monolith. And certainly, if you disaggregate them, you see very, very different electorates uh, in Georgia and North Carolina and classic southern states in the Rust Belt in um, uh, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and so on. And then, of course, in the Sun Belt, where we are increasingly seeing gains in, in Arizona and Nevada and so on. Um, we're going to disaggregate these a little bit for um, the key racial groupings that we just talked about. So firstly, with black voters, here we're looking at the share of the electorate compared to 2018 again. And um, as we saw, um, black voters nationally fell by about two points um, in their vote share. Um, in highly contested states, you see a more parity, um, ultimately about a one point decrease um, in from 12% in 2018 to about 11% of the electorate. But if you start looking at, um, at the disaggregated view, you see that most of the drop in vote share among black voters compared to 2018 came in, in uh, Georgia and North Carolina. So these um, southern states with a history uh, of uh, organizing with electrifying black candidates on the ballot were nonetheless um, a vote share for black voters uh, decreased by about two to three points, three points in North Carolina and two points in Georgia. And because the largest um, uh, uh, agglomeration of black voters is in North Carolina and Georgia in these highly contested states. Uh, that drop is what is showing up nationally and in aggregate, and it is masking more stability in these other areas in Ohio and Pennsylvania, Nevada, Arizona, and so on. So we need to watch for a decrease in black support, particularly uh, when it comes to um, states with a large population of black voters. Um, next slide, please, Hillary. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Now um, we look at black support in each of these states. You see a three point decrease in support among black voters. Um, 
uh, in nationally, as we mentioned previously, and you see about uh, about stable, but about a one point decrease, but it's rounding. It's about the same as as 2020 among Biden's coalition. Here, the opposite story presents itself. Um, in Georgia and North Carolina, you actually see an increase in support, even compared to President Biden's coalition. Um, we are definitely hitting ceiling effects here, so it's pretty extraordinary that we're seeing support increase from about 93% in 2020 to about 95, 4, 95% um, for uh, Stacey, for Warnock, and for uh, Beasley. Um, but again, because this is the largest group of Black voters in, um, in the highly contested states, uh, this stability and even increase is actually masking a drop in Black support. Um, sometimes pretty substantially. For example, in the Hobbs race in Arizona, you see a double digit drop. Um, the exact numbers here might be a, a little bit uh, a, 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 an artifact of modeling, so we wouldn't focus too much, but that is to say that um, we need to keep an eye on black support, particularly in the North, where we see some drops. Um, next slide, please, Hillary. Then we focus on Hispanic voters. Uh, oh, excuse me, uh, a, a big um, focus um, on race reviews um, on the hard side and the soft side uh, in both 20 and 2022 uh, was where are we seeing this decrease in black support, but also black turnout. Um, and um, a lot of conversations have already focused on how a, 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 this um, a decrease in support has been really focused among the youngest populations. So black voters age 18 to 29 uh, tended to drop in support even compared to President Biden's coalition by seven points. So 92% um, support for President Biden down to 84%, excuse me, Hillary, um, in 2022. Um, ultimately, um, uh, youngest black voters still remain incredibly supportive of Democrats. Almost nine out of every 10 voters vote for Democrats. They, they form the spine of the Democratic uh, coalition overall. Uh, but um, uh, uh, support among Black voters has been deteriorating, and it's particularly focused on youngest voters. Um, this decrease in support was blanched a little bit among highly contested states. So again, this two electorates um, uh, coming up here uh, by about five points, and among 30 to 44 year olds, you saw almost no drop off in support. Uh, but certainly uh, among the youngest voters, we did see a five point drop uh, in these highly contested states as well. Um, next slide, please, Hillary. Thank you. Um, now turning our attention to Latino voters, the big picture here is of stability compared to President Biden coalition in 2020. In Florida, you continue to see a drop, a pretty uh, substantial drop in support for Democrats um, uh, compared to 2020 as well. But ultimately, Florida is a very distinct case. I'm sure a lot of us have been thinking about it, or having have had conversations with several of you. Um, there are some key differences, of course. First is in terms of the shape of the electorate. The Latino electorate in Florida, a, a, a large plurality is uh, Cuban, but outside of Florida, a large majority um, has Mexican American ethnicity and or country of origin. That is certainly not the only distinction. Uh, the issue landscape was very distinct uh, in Florida and the, the same issues tend to hit folks differently um, especially in Southern Miami and Osceola district areas. Uh, but um, um, ultimately, in outside of Florida, you see extreme, extraordinary stability. Um, even in Arizona, where Mark Kelly um, uh, uh, really continues to be an extraordinary brand locally in the state, um, he uh, saw an increase of about four points in Latino support. Um, uh, but um, certainly, I think the big picture on the sobering side is that um, support, even though it remains stable compared to 2020, did not rebound to 2016 levels across the map. So quite a bit of work to continue doing um, there in terms of persuasion and turnout. Um, and then finally, um, Hillary, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, among AAPI voters, um, uh, we are looking at the drop in support. As we mentioned, there was a seven point decrease in support. That is um, happening uh, in uh, parallel with a substantial increase in the vote share among black voters, both, uh, excuse me, among AAPI voters, both due to a high baseline um, participation among AAPI voters, but also the extraordinary uh, uh, growth in the community. It is the fastest growing racial umbrella in the United States, and it will be the largest 
uh, non-white group by 2060. Uh, so even compared to 2014, you see extraordinary increases in the, the blue bar compared to the gray bar. But compared to 2018, which was extremely high salience, you continue to see an increase in vote share among AAPI voters across the board, particularly in states like Nevada, in Arizona, in Georgia, where we won um, in really narrow uh, margins. Paths to victory certainly lead uh, through the AAPI community, and we have to keep an eye out for the decrease in support that we are seeing there. Uh, with that, over um, to analyzing gender in the shadow of Dobbs and other factors. Um, uh, to you, Hillary. Thanks. Um, so as we um, look, um, take a more uh, closer look at um, white voters, and particularly um, white voters by education, um, it's important to note kind of um, back to the original point around the tale of two electorates, um, what was happening that was different in the um, national races versus these highly competitive races. Um, and when we look at um, white non-college women in particular, we see that in these most highly competitive elections, um, a four point gain in support um, among Democrats. Obviously, um, Democrats still held um, well against um, with white college women, but this increase in white non-college women was um, a particular um, note to us um, in, in our findings. And when we um, also look at this um, by gender, what we see is that despite this small decline um, in support nationally, um, sorry, the gender and marital status among um, single women, right? So going from 64 um, uh, support in 2020 um, nationally to um, 62, so a small drop there. Um, there was this slight increase in the places with these most highly competitive elections. Um, you contrast that with um, men, both single and uh, married men, um, once again, losing ground um, nationally, but to the um, earlier point, still holding steady to where they were in 2020, um, compared to 2022. Um, and so as we um, take a look at some of these um, additional issues, Dobbs and uh, MAGA extremism, one of the things that we um, wanted to note was that the, a larger percentage of voters nationally, so ac across the board, um, were moving more towards the um, Democrats' position um, on abortion, a larger percentage of voters saying that abortion should be legal. Um, and this was an, a change that we saw in 2022 compared to 2020. Um, undoubtedly, the Dobbs decision played um, some role in this shift of attitudes um, as we move through um, the election. As we um, take a look at the impact of Dobbs, particularly on um, women and their registration, what we observed here in this chart is that prior to the Dobbs decision in um, that June um, window, we noticed that women made up about 50% of registrations. And so the registrations um, of new registrants. And so that 50% that really hovered um, really hovered in that range from January moving through, um, moving into the early part of the summer. However, once the Dobbs decision came out, we observed this big spike in the um, proportion of women of in new registrants. So the, going from around 50% to about 55% of new registrants. Um, and then while that spike does come down um, pretty dramatically and pretty quickly, what the other important thing to note is that it never quite goes down, back down to that 50% level. It's still kind of hanging out there in around 52 to 53, creating um, a real registration advantage or increase for um, women as we were heading into the November election. And then finally, just to um, round out our discussion and, and talk about the um, MAGA extremist candidates. Um, so it's important to note that while these candidates candidates were strong election deniers, um, and this is using the election deniers definition as um, done from an analysis by the Washington Post, um, it wasn't just that they were extreme on election denial. These candidates were also extreme on cutting benefits and also extreme on abortion. And so it's hard to fully um, disentangle election, being an election denier from other extreme positions that these candidates held. Um, but nonetheless, in the places with the most competitive elections, these candidates performed about 1.5 points worse than Donald Trump did in 2020. Um, contrast that to the less competitive places where um, these um, denier candidates did a, on par, maybe mildly better than Trump did in the less competitive places. Um, but focusing in on these highly competitive um, elections, there's something here where the these extremist candidates are not quite um, connecting in the same way that Trump did in these highly competitive places. 
And I think this will be something that um, we should keep our eye on as we um, pivot and move into the 2024 uh, election. Um, and um, with that, that concludes our presentation. Um, here we are just um, recapping all the findings that we um, have discussed with you all today. Um, and then as hopefully, as you all know, um, you can find our full report online at catalyst.us slash what happened uh, 2022. And that is catalyst with an I, not a Y. And um, on that um, site, you can see um, our full written report, which um, covers a lot of the things that we have discussed here um, in a bit more detail and in written form. Um, and in addition to that, we also do provide um, a set of cross tabs that are publicly available. Um, so if you all want to um, go um, online and just take a look and play around the cross tabs yourself, uh, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, and with that, we will um, open it up to any questions that you all um, might have. Fantastic. Thank oh, you sorry, that. Harris, go ahead. No problem. While we're looking for questions, I think one quick note, we are doing um, far more detailed analyses by constituency group, uh, several of which we mentioned here, and also key, key states, which is coming up later in the summer and the fall. We would really, really love your thoughts uh, on what areas you would like to focus on, and, and we can make sure that if the data allows it, we can try and answer some questions. That sounds great. How would you like us to encourage folks to connect with you with those thoughts? Because I know they will have them. Yeah, we, uh, please feel free to shoot us an email um, and um, we can start from there, if that makes sense. That sounds great. And uh, Sarah, our producer is going to post some uh, links in the chat and has been posting them so that you can uh, connect with the terrific and really smart team at Catalyst if that is what you would like, but you're also always welcome to send them our way. So um, Horace, Hillary, I wanna start with uh, just a couple of clarifying questions about some of the terms that you use to quantify your data. Um, and the number one that keeps coming up is, is this phrase of um, highly contested. And Horace, you made a, a reference to how you all, what that means. So if you could say a little bit more about that phrase, highly contested, um, yeah. There's a couple of questions in here about states that are or are not highly contested. So let's start there, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think that that um, sounds great. Uh, we define highly contested as um, which were um, def uh, which were categorized as toss up or lean um, in October um, by the ratings agencies. Uh, we looked at this in any number of different ways, uh, including um, by margin. Uh, but ultimately, um, we wanted to have an outside objective source of definition, um, and we looked at sort of very deeply at the state, uh, the states that are counted as highly competitive, excuse me, highly contested, um, and they tend to be very stable across uh, midterms and presidential years as as the the battlefield that we are all used to seeing. Um, but we we wanted to make a demarcation between contested, which is um, these potentially could, could have been close races uh, with a lot of investment and competitive, which is where they kind of ended up. Um, Ohio, for example, was not highly competitive. It was outside the margin, but it was heavily, heavily contested, uh, particularly by Tim Ryan. So that's why we are using rating, ratings agencies and a perspective view um, uh, that is um, sort of determined by investment uh, rather than the ultimately the ultimate margin. So we say contested rather than competitive. Great. And then just to follow up, this is curiosity from my own brain, which is, or when you're looking at this, you call a state highly contested. I know you and Hillary, as I was joking, come from both sides of the house, one previously from the Senate, one previously from the house, right? How, when there are multiple races at stake in, a, in one state, how mm -hmm. does that impact that highly contested um, rating, so to speak? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, basically, in, for brevity and for time, um, the, we wanted to look at the, the key sort of top line driver here, which was statewide races. Um, ultimately, particularly in midterms, it is high salient statewide races, gubernatorial and Senate races uh, that tend to shape the electorate and drive turnout. So that is what we wanted to focus on here. We also, in some of the analysis, for example, that Hillary presented the Washington Post analysis, we look at house level competitive um, uh, uh, districts as well, but categorizing house districts becomes pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so we've kept it at the statewide level for now. And we see a Terrific. very clear story. Great, thank you. And and uh, thanks for thanks for 
um, lassoing our government nerddom so that we keep <laughs> keep on task. I really appreciate it. Um, this is a this is a question that builds on that data. And for either of you, it's from Craig Kaplan. What um, what does the data from the highly contested states tell us about not highly contested states like New York or California, if anything? Um, that's a good question. I think one of the things, um, uh, so broadly speaking, you know, the, the races in California and New York were considered less competitive than some of these like really high, highly competitive races in, um, you know, Michigan, Arizona, Nevada. Um, and I think one of the things that we have found interesting and just kind of thinking through what are some of the key differences there is the impact of Dobbs um, in those states as compared to the impact that might have been felt in places like a Michigan or a Pennsylvania. I think that in places like California and New York, where there were already a lot of um, protections and posture around protecting um, the abortion rights in those places, a decision like Dobbs has a less of an impact in um, mobilizing the um, electorate and it allows other local issues to really kind of permeate and salience in those um, particular places, right? So where, the, so where um, those um, abortion rights felt more protected, um, potentially things like crime or other issues um, that, are, that are more local kind of bubble up to the surface and might explain some of the difference in performance um, that we observed there. Um, but as I always like to say, I should probably have caveated this at the front, you know, we like to call this the what happened report, not why it happened. <laughs> so we tend to kind of shy away from um, too much speculation on, on what might have been driving some of that. But um, I think that, um, it, that that could very well be part of the explanation for um, some of the differences that, um, that we observed there. Absolutely. And I would also, I think, ultimately, national, like investment patterns were also different, right? Like the New York races felt a little bit more like sleeper races and investment came in September, October. Um, I think that was certainly true. And, um, and they were more competitive than was expected. Um, exactly, I think I totally agree with Hillary's overall thesis that the issue landscape was, um, was quite different in New Jersey, in New York, in Washington, in California races. Um, the, the, the other piece here is that um, with this national investment and attention turned on to the battlefield, um, the opposing both sides got a heavy scrutiny. Um, and the sort of the extreme MAGA candidates, um, their records on a number of issues um, were litigated heavily. But at the end of the day, in a place like New York, in a place like California, particularly down ballot, which receives less attention, um, you saw some of those candidates um, sort of um, sneak through um, in the point that Hillary was making um, earlier about the comparison with Trump. So I think certainly this calls for um, uh, early wider investment uh, down ballot as well. Terrific, thank you. Uh, so our next group of questions um, may may toe that line, Hillary, that you just pointed out about the what happened versus why it happened. So uh, feel free to remind us that you said that. Um, and still, y'all are y'all are y'all are smart people, and you spend a lot of time with this data. So I think we're all interested to hear um, your analysis. So I'm I'm actually going to start with a quick question about. Um, the voter population data that you shared uh, in the first section of the slides, um, particularly as it pertains to the, um, the group of folks who identify as Black in electorate. One of the things that I'm curious about is how your data accounts for, if it does, if it's able to account for voter suppression that's been happening over the past few um, elections. So can you say some, uh, can you give us some detail about that, please? Yeah, no, that's that's a really um, great question. And I think, first of all, you know, it's um, voter suppression tactics absolutely, you know, play have, have an impact right on communities and either and either actual results or just the perception right of how easy or hard it is is to vote. And that can affect attitudes towards, you know, whether or not people show up to vote um, on Election Day. Ultimately, like as a data company and kind of where we're positioned, we can only um, take advantage of the data that's available to us, right? And so to the extent that we're able to see um, distinct patterns in, in suppression, it can be a little kind of tricky to pick it up um, fully yeah. in the data. Um, and, and kind of going back to the, you know, I, I think that it can explain sometimes maybe part of what's going on, but in terms of being like de definitive proof, um, 
it's just it's just tricky to pick up because we are limited yeah. by the data that the that the states provide. Um, and so that's kind yeah. of already baked in. It's a bit of a catch twenty two, right? It was the, the voters are being removed from the rolls and you're reading the rolls. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And and I totally, totally agree with Hillary. It is really difficult to isolate. Uh, all right, we saw, for example, in Georgia, black voters um, uh, vote share decreased by a couple of points compared to 2018. Now, did that, what was the exact voter suppression law that caused that to happen? Uh, is a very difficult um, to isolate that from all the other um, uh, socioeconomic factors that lead to you successfully casting a ballot. So that, that is particularly difficult. But what we do know is that um, there were uh, four, almost, I think, 40 bills, voting, uh, restrictive voting or restrictive registration bills were considered in 2022 uh, by our partners over at the Brennan Center. They've been tracking it. And out of them, about 10 states passed pretty restrictive voting and or registration laws. So there's no question that that has an impact. Just because we can't run an experiment, essentially, to identify it, I think that there's no question that um, um, that that has been having an impact and it will continue to. Um, I think the only other fact I wanted to point out here is that um, traditional voter protection and cure um, activities um, were um, received less investment this time because um, people are using mail a lot less than they were in 2020. Um, right. So um, a lot of the, the restrictive laws that have been passed have been around mail and, and voter ID interacting with mail. But ultimately, people have really moved away from it. And, and, the, and the left and Democrats have really worked hard to um, continue um, having information around voting early in person rather than in mail. So I think, you know, our, on a qualitative rev level, our organizing teams and our electoral teams and, and certainly our IE teams are very focused on this. Um, but it's just because there are so many different factors at play, uh, it's hard to isolate and give you an exact answer. That's really helpful. Thanks to you both. Oh, sorry, Hillary, did you want to add anything else to that? Um, no, just um, wanted to agree with a lot of what Horace mentioned, just in terms of the, the isolation being really difficult because we're looking at you know a variety of factors that, that may have played a role. That makes great sense. There's a couple more questions from the audience um, specific to the black voter data. So I'm gonna add those here. Um, Matt is saying that you showed the shift in democratic support among black voters by age, but was wondering if you could speak a little bit about turnout compared to 2018 among black voters by age. Mm. Sure, give me one. Um, we'll just pull up the spreadsheet that Hillary mentioned. Um, Yes, Matt says, I see it is in the cross tabs, but because the percentage of the electorate is so small, it's tough to discern a level of drop. That's exactly right. Um, ultimately, um, um, black voters who are 18 to 29 year old make up a very small, like about 2%, not even, of the national electorate overall in all races. So it is very, very difficult um, to tr um, precisely track exactly what's going on here. And that's another reason to put an asterisk against the seven point drop that we're seeing among black voters, 18 to 29 year old. Um, uh, we have looked at composition in a number of different ways. So with the caveat that we just drew here, I think what we can say is that the larger movement is among vote choice. It isn't among Democrats sitting down and Republicans um, uh, 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 sort of um, casting a ballot um, in a higher proportion this cycle. Um, we, we are actually seeing people move away from the Democratic Party. I think that much is clear, but um, really getting down to it is very difficult for modeling. Okay, thank you. And then um, it just jumped on me, apologies for that. Jill was uh, asking that you made note of the relationship between age and black voter performance. And uh, Jill's wondering, does that hold true for both uh, men and women? Yeah, so um, we're looking um, more closely at this data as part of our um, constituency um, reports that we're planning to release later this summer and fall. Um, but generally speaking, from the observations that we've made so far, we noticed about a four point drop nationally um, in, in Black male support um, compared to like about a one point drop among Black women. Um, so there does seem to be um, something particularly and something in particular that's happening by um, by gender, like the gender dynamic there for sure. Um, however, when we're looking at the the um, spreadsheet by age and seeing that it's the youngest voters um, with that with those bigger um, uh, support, the bigger support drop, 
Um, kind of to Horace's point, it gets a little bit tricky to kind to also layer in um, gender there because you get because you're getting to like like smaller and smaller groups. Um, but we're going to try to take a look at that as part of our um, uh, so, uh, as part of our constituency reports, just to try to pinpoint whether or not um, to your to your point um, is that a drop that we're seeing primarily among young black men versus young black women. Um, if I had to guess, just based on the findings that we've seen so far. I would say it's probably a drop among both, but maybe a little bit more among young black men. Um, but there's um, definitely more to come um, there. Totally agree. Great. Would you both um, say a little bit more? There's a lot of a lot of folks who are interested to hear more about the various um, racial identity groups that we're able to gather from the data and what are some trends or outcomes? So for example, can you say more about the shift in Hispanic voters? Um, can you say more about the AAPI? I, I, my question is um, really about, because I know I, I understand a little bit about what you're reading, you know, what you're drawing conclusions from. Mm -hmm. How, I think what I'm trying to figure out is how are we keeping pace with the rapidly evolving, these rapidly evolving populations, right? So, um, you know, all black people are not the same. All Latino people are not the same. All AAPI people are not the same. And yet the information that we have groups all these folks together. Um, so would you, all, would you all say some more about that? And you can read the question, more specific questions that are here in the Q&A, but I'm, I'm curious, especially after Harris's statement, like democratic support is dropping, but also we're seeing there's lots of democratic multiracial support. So, um, I, and I warned you that we would be on that line between what happened and why is it happening? Here we are again. Uh, I don't know that I formed a really specific question for y'all, but you're nodding your head. So I think you've got something to say in response to what yeah. I've said. So please go yeah. for it. I'm, I, I think there's, there's, there are a few different ways to think about it, right? I think when you're looking at um, API and um, uh, Latino groups in particular, there are um, obviously different ethnicities and different um, uh, immigration stories and, and whatnot that, that make up that diversity of opinions and, and diversity of perspectives among those groups. And that's just something that can be um, hard to capture fully in the data um, because of how um, a lot of that data is stored and, and coded. Um, and so it can be hard to really kind of parse apart um, uh, a lot of um, specific um, differentiations, especially when you're working with smaller um, subgroup populations. Um, you know, to the extent that we um, have observed, you know, those distinct differences with Florida and the Cuban population versus elsewhere with Latinos who um, are primarily um, of Mexican um, origin or descent. Um, I, I think that that's like part of a story that we can tell there. But um, once again, just kind of breaking down those groups is it, it's hard to do because it's something that's just harder to observe. Um, I think the other thing to note, especially um, looking at um, Black voters and API voters is um, geographical differences and what we've mm -hmm. observed as well. So um, among the, those highly competitive states, and we're talking about that, um, the, the change in AAPI support, we're really just looking at Nevada, right? Because that was a highly competitive state with a really substantial AAPI population. Um, and it's and other states that have high AAPI populations include um, California and New York, where we know democratic performance was lower. So when you're looking at that seven point drop in um, democratic support among AAPI voters um, in the slide that we showed previously, um, it's probably safe to say that that's being driven by the lower democratic performance in um, California and New York um, in particular. Um, and then, you know, similarly, um, going back to Black voters and the age differences, right, there's, there's remarkable stability among older Black voters. Democratic um, support among that group was virtually unchanged, but there's something different that's happening at that, at the younger level, right? And so it's hard, um, and and a lot of you know what we're trying to better understand and do. I think this was, this was kind of like the the ethos of the of the question, right? Is how do you account for all of those like directionally different um, uh, variations and diversities within these different groups? Um, and so to the best that we can, we um, you know write them out as clearly as possible where like the direction that we're looking in. Yeah. Um, but, you know, also to just to be transparent and, and acknowledge some of the limitations, especially when it comes to identifying, um, you know, sub ethnicities and being able to, to track that um, effectively. Yeah. Of course, I don't have anything else to add there. 
No, I think that's a great point that Hillary is raising. I, and it's a great question because ultimately I totally agree with you that um, a, a lot of um, far too many people um, uh, tend to view uh, black, AAPI, Latino, multiracial, biracial folks as monoliths. And um, part of our mission at Catalyst, one of the foundational sort of missions on the on uh, from the analysis side of Catalyst is to try and disaggregate these communities as much as we possibly can, which is right. why we released um, the cross tabs um, along with um, our overall report, which, you know, because of space and time issues, we have to kind of keep to the top lines. We have two way cross tabs for just about every group that you can think about. So um, among black voters, for example, we can cross tab that by age, by um, education, by, uh, you know, likely to have college or not, by urbanicity, by um, gender, by marital status and so on. And uh, so we have done a lot of those deep, deep dives for all of the ethnicities that we're looking at right now, including, I think, geography, which is a critical point that Hillary mentioned. And mm -hmm. there are two or three sort of clear trends here. Number one, um, uh, for white voters, um, white non-college voters have remained aligned with Democrats. There's been, edu there've been certainly, I think, um, reduction around the edges, that's important to keep in mind. But mm -hmm. um, the, the question is whether this will continue, right? Like the le realignment of white non-college voters will continue. Second is uh, among, uh, uh, sorry, white college voters. Second is among white non-college voters. We saw a drop in participation in midterms. One of the, the, re the this tribalization of white non-college voters towards Republicans means that Republicans also have a bit of a turnout problem when it comes to midterms and off-year elections. Um, because uh, a lot of non-college voters are just less engaged in the electoral process. So the big question of, for Mike non-college voters is, number one, will they surge again compared to 20, uh, uh, 16 and 20 when Trump was on the ballot? Um, and number two, will their support remain um, as strong for the Republicans as it has uh, since 2016? I think um, among Black voters, um, the big question that, that I have looking at these data that Hillary and I have discussed a lot is, all right, like, two pieces are really important to keep an eye on. One is vote share has been dropping in some of these key states. And if you compare that to the extremely narrow uh, margins of victory, um, you know th that is something that we absolutely have to keep an eye on, given that Black voters remain the spine of the Democratic coalition and mm -hmm. vote nine out of 10 times. So, and then secondly, among support that we are losing, it's pretty clear that it's that it is correlated with younger voters. Uh, the younger the voter, the more likely you are to lose a bit of support for Democrats. Why is it happening? There was an excellent question around that. W what Catalyst can do is um, cut samples, and then we can um, partner with qualitative um, polling and um, uh, opinion research companies or polling and, uh, companies. We're already doing that a lot to understand the why and how do we reverse that or at least stop it. Um, the, the third piece is among Latino voters, have we hit, uh, a, 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 are we close to hitting a floor now? R uh, because Latino support by age, by um, gender, by all these other factors was extremely stable compared to 2020. Um, so the question is whether we're gonna uh, continue seeing that sort of erosion of support or have we stopped there? And are there particular states where we can get to a 2016 level support? Um, and then finally among AAPI voters, I think, it is so crucial that we start a disaggregated intersectional program um, and we support the organizations that are on the ground already doing this kind of work. Let's not head to where we were with the Latino community mm -hmm. where 2016 was we saw this shock of different ethnicities and different um, 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 populations by education and urbanicity were moving away from each other within the Latino umbrella. We are still considering AAPI voters as one big block because it's smaller. But ultimately, there are certainly subgroups that are moving away from us. It's pretty clear. And I think we have to continue providing the kind of data that Catalyst is committed to providing to further understand this. I, I think that's the, some of the conclusions. Thank you. Um, yeah, brilliant. It's, it's, it was a, a, a complicated question about a complicated situation, right? We're um, just about at time, unfortunately, because of course we could go on and on for many hours, I'm sure. Um, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, speak about the one of the most popular questions is sort of your final wrap up commentary, if you if you won't mind, if you don't mind. Hannah Beth was asking about, with all the data that shows substantial democratic support, um, again, sorry, it's a why question. Why do we continue <laughs> to see Biden's numbers so underwater? So what would you all like to say about that? 
Uh, well, yeah, first of all, very, very much a um, wide question, but I think it's a fantastic question and really kind of illustrates some of this paradox. I mean, uh, kind of one of my big initial um, takeaways that was so interesting was seeing this like sustained youth, um, young voter support around, you know, 60% um, percent in these elections for, you know, one of the oldest presidents that, that we've had, I think is like a really interesting kind of um, a paradox. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think, um, and once again, this is, you know, speculating on the why, right? I think part of it has to do with just the, the opposition and the extremist, extremist, extremism of that opposition and what it might mean for the futures of um, that youngest cohort, whether you're talking about um, the future of democracy, the future of um, rights that people have fought so hard for, um, or the future of the climate, right? And how um, how the um, extremism on the right in that regard um, is kind of pushing um, younger voters more um, towards um, the democratic position, um, kind of irrespective of their feelings around the individual candidates um, that that may be running. So I think that that could be um, part of it. If I had to speculate why we might be seeing low numbers for um, low low favorability numbers for Biden, but you know still this strong support um, uh, in the vote um, itself. Um, yeah. Harris, I don't know if you have anything else to add on there. Yeah, I think Hillary, the piece that you mentioned around the demarket, like delineating um, two-way choice from support is so, so crucial, right? Like Biden's mm -hmm. numbers were underwater before 2022 as well. And um, so many groups on this call, um, it, and the o overall ecosystem spent um, a long time, I think pretty successfully um, uh, imposing a different lens on the electorate, which is it's a two-way choice. It, it's, it's a choice between increasingly polarized opinions around how, how we should govern uh, our country. Um, so uh, I think that is important to consider here. I think the relationship between approval and two-way choice is also deteriorating. <laughs> After 2016, a lot of political axioms are falling. Why not this one? Yeah, um, exactly. But there are two sort of pieces that we should really, I think, focus on to Hillary's point. Number one is this incredibly polarized electorate. Um, if you look at Biden polling right now, it's really among the opposite party, Republicans, where you're seeing really underwater um, I think a plus four uh, margin and 90% opposed to, to Biden, right? Like um, uh, these are Trump kind of numbers. Trump automatically saw that for the Democratic side. So we're seeing the first, I think, big driver here is polarization. Um, and the question is whether really any Democratic president is going to see substantially improved numbers there. And then the second, I think, exactly as Hillary was pointing out, is um, what are the issue sets that are really um, affecting people right now? And that's the economy. It's it's particularly inflation. People are really affected by it. And you're seeing that from an inter inter intersectional perspective among young voters, among uh, POC voters, and so on. Um, and um, as those numbers are improving, I think Biden's um, uh, uh, approvals and Democrats' chances will continue to improve, but within certain limits, because I don't think we're ever going to now have too many crossover votes. I, I think at the same time, Obama was plus 16 or plus 20, um, and we're never going to see that again, unfortunately, I think, uh, un until we really try and bring people together um, politically. All right, well, I'll borrow a dad joke and say, you may be the ha-has, but y'all are no joke. This was <laughs> fantastic. Um, and thank you. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing this with our audience. We really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, we could go on for many hours, but we've already kept you past time. Um, thanks for your grace uh, and your good humor um, and for all the work that you do. It's, it's, um, it's heartening in times like these to know that folks like you are out there doing, doing the heavy lifting. Um, and so we appreciate it and we hope to see you again soon. Um, and for our friends in the audience, want to thank you. We're going to take a little hiatus in the month of August, and we'll be back again, not on the first Monday, but in early September. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. And we hope that you will stay well and keep moving. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Take care.